it's uh, it's fun to go through the catechism because you know they wouldn't make these catechism questions unless there was some reason, some issue, some point of theology that's very important, or some controversy that uh, arises in in the church. And we see a lot of these things that were written hundreds of years ago still apply today, still confuse people today. And so it's it's always good to be knowledgeable of the catechism and the answers so that we know what the truth is. And uh, of course, uh, that it's not true because it's in the catechism, it's true because it's in the Bible. And so part of what we do when we go through these questions is show all the verses that apply to the, um, to the, to the question. So this week we're looking at question 28. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and read it. What are the punishments of sin in this world? What are the punishments of sin in this world? All right, here's the answer. The punishments of sin in this world are either inward, as blindness of mind, a reprobate sense, strong delusions, hardness of heart, horror of conscience, and vile affections, or outward, as the curse of God upon the creatures for our sakes, and all other evils that befall us in our bodies, names, estates, relations, and employments, together with death itself. All right. It's long, but it's, it's not complicated. It's just a list, right? So we have the, uh, <clears throat> the inward things, okay, and then they have a list, and then they have the uh, outward things, and then there's a list, and, and then they tag on death in its own category. All right, these are the punishments of sin in this world. All right, so what are some of the things that are inward? I'm not going to look at my paper. You guys got to tell me. Blindness of mind. Okay, blindness of mind. All right, what else? A reprobate sense. Reprobate <laughs> sense. Okay, like I said, this was written hundreds of years ago. That's a good diss, right? We might, a reprobate sense. we might use different words today. Oh, man, I'm going to have to get a new marker. All right, what was that one, Bob? Hardness of heart. Hardness of heart. Okay, what else? Is that it? Horror of conscience. Oh, yes. Let's not forget that one. Horror of conscience. Vile affections. Vile affections. Oh, I love that. Strong delusions. Yeah, let's not leave any out. <laughs> Strong delusions. Okay. See, it's just a list. A list. These are the inward things. All right, what are the outward things? Curse of God. All right. What else? Evils that befall us. Okay. Evils that befall us. Okay. And then that's another list, isn't it? Yeah. All right. So we have a list within the list. All right. What are the evils that befall us? Illness. Okay. Illness. Wait. That's not this here. That's, that's oh. Well, it says body, so I guess that's what you're saying. Okay. Okay, sure. Illness and disease, so bodies. All right. What else? Names. Names. Estates. Estates. Relations. Relations. Employments. <coughs> Employments. Okay. And a lot of that comes out of the Deuteronomy passage, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later. All right, so you guys see how it's structured then. We've got the inward stuff, we've got the outward stuff, we've got death, and then within each of these, we're listed various things. We're gonna talk about these in more detail uh, as we go through the verses, but, um, you know, that's, that's what we're talking about. The punishments of sin in this world. All right, so some of the scriptures on the first page of your handout, uh, we've got a lot of different scriptures 
and uh, many of these are talking directly to uh, the things we've put up here on the board. And the first one there is blindness of heart and mind as a punishment for sin. Okay, so this is talking about that blindness. And in Ephesians 4.18 it says, They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. Alright, so there's this darkness in their understanding. Alright, All right, the next one is a reprobate mind. Uh, a punishment for sin, Romans 1, 28. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. <coughs> All right, so we, we say debased here uh, in relation to reprobate. And then the next one, strong delusion sent by God, a punishment for sin. <coughs> From 2 Thessalonians 2, 11. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false. And then the next one, hardness and an impenitent heart from Romans 2, 5. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will, will be revealed. All right, and the next one's horrors of conscience. All right, you see how we're going through these verses, and it's all the stuff that the divines put in here uh, as the answer. Horrors of conscience, one of the ways God uh, punishes men. Isaiah 33, 14, the sinners in Zion are afraid. Trembling has seized the godless. Who among us can dwell with a consuming fire? Who among us can dwell with everlasting burnings? There's this horror even though they're unbelievers or sinners, they're still uh, in horror of this punishment. Genesis 4.13, Cain said, My punishment is greater than I can bear. And in Matthew 24, or, uh, 27, 4, uh, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And he said, What is that to us? See to it yourself. So we have, we have over and over again in Scripture this horror of conscience that happens even among uh, unbelievers. Uh, next, sinners punished by being given over to vile passions. Uh, Romans 1.26 For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the larger passage, we're going to talk about this a little bit more uh, when we get to the question time too. But the larger passage, passage there in Romans 1 talks about uh, this issue, being given over to vile passions. Uh, the next one, God's curse upon the world of nature, a penalty for human sin. Uh, Genesis, Genesis 3, 17, uh, to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. And so much of the punishment of sin in this world goes all the way back to the fall. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more too. Uh, the next one, all calamities, sufferings, and evils are punishments for sin. In Deuteronomy 28, But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, or be careful to do all His commandments and His statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come, come upon you and overtake you. And uh, pretty much that whole chapter is about all of the curses and punishments and, and all these things that will happen to the ones who do not follow the Lord, who do not obey His commandments. Um, Alright, the last uh, verse there on the front. Death itself is the wages or penalty of sin. And in Romans 6, uh, it says, but what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. And in verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. All right, so those are all the verses, or some of the verses, some pretty good selection of verses that are the background for why this is the answer to the question. And uh, we're going to go through and talk about 
uh, these various parts in a little bit more detail now on the back as we go through these questions. All right, so first question, what is the spiritual state of unsaved persons? And uh, if you look at the, uh, the first verse, the first section of verses there, blindness part, you'll see the answer. What is the spiritual state of unsaved persons? Yeah, alienated from the life of God. Okay. Yeah. Alienated from the life of God. Absolutely. Dark. Dark? What's that dark mean? Dark. Dark. Like, you know, those who are in Christ are in the light of the world because they oh, have Christ in okay. them and that reflects to others. And those that don't have Christ in them <coughs> are filled with darkness and everything about them is darkness. They're thinking their actions. Well, that's pretty good. I, I didn't thought to compare it to uh, the believers being the light of the world. That's really good. That's like our that. daily work. That's what we do every day. We interact with the darkness. That's true. That's true. And so, the unsaved person has the spiritual darkness, this deadness, this... <clears throat> Kind of sad. Yeah. Yeah. I also think in Romans 8 where it says that those who are according to the flesh cannot please God. Mm-hmm. Cannot please God. So there's, there is no spiritual state. That's one way to put it. I mean, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Enemies. Right. Enemies. Yeah. All right. Second question. Is the unsaved person responsible for his own blindness of mind? Hmm. Interesting question. Well, we, we have uh, one of the places that we can see the answer is in Ephesians 4.18. Uh, yeah, it, look, it, look, it looks like just going to that passage that you, that you pointed out. Um, it looks like Paul is is essentially blaming the, the sinner and saying, due to their hardness of heart. This is theirs. This belongs to them. They're the ones that are guilty for it. And if you go to his lengthier discussion in Romans 1-3, which is all about sin, he clearly blames, he doesn't blame God there, he blames the sinner so that every mouth may be stopped. And Absolutely. That's Absolutely. It sounds like they're ignorant, so if they try to eliminate their ignorance, they might change themselves. And that would help. That would help. Listen to the gospel. Listen to the words of life. Submit to the Lord's teaching. That would help. Um, all right, third question. What is the meaning? Yeah. I'm thinking of predestination. And I'm thinking that they want to, we all are going to have this hardness of heart until we are all from God. Yep. And, and not everyone will be called, or will everyone be called? No, not everyone will be called. I mean, well, as theologians, we talk about two calls. We talk about an outward call, which is just the proclamation of the gospel. And even the outward call is not offered to all, right? There are places that missionaries have not gone to yet. Um, And so there are people who are still not even receiving the outward call. But we also talk about the inward call, which is the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, uh, the Lord giving uh, his elect the ability to repent and turn in faith to Christ. And so that's... And not everybody receives that call either. Does that answer your question? Then that takes me back to our answer to number one. Our team, number two. The unsaved person is going to remain unsaved until he or she. Okay. 
Hold on to that, because we're going to get more into that as we go. Okay? All right. Um, all right, number three then. What is the meaning of the expression, a reprobate sense? And uh, if you look at uh, Romans 1.28, uh, you'll find the answer there. Or you can base your answer on, on that. Well, it's interesting because uh, on Romans 1.28, God gave him up to the base mind to do what ought not to be done. And then you go down to Romans 1.26, dishonorable passions. You know, so it's like it just leads right down the road to all those other things. Yeah. And it's, when you think about this debased mind, there's, the, the key thing is there's little restraint. There's little restraint. You know, the Lord um, restrains our evilness. Um, if we were left without God's restraining power, it would be like, uh, you know, just before the flood, the days of Noah, where the Lord said, and their, their thoughts continually are of evil. Just nothing good at whatsoever. But the Lord is, and we see this in, in the lives of even the unbelieving, um, depending on what culture they're in, they're, they're still taught morality. They're still taught, you know, what is right and wrong. Love your neighbor as yourself, you know. And even if they don't have faith, the Lord is restraining the amount of evil by giving a sense of, you know, we should do good to others. And, and you know, you guys know what I'm saying? Um, but this, this debased mind impacts um, those people still because there's this, this desire to go deeper and deeper and deeper into sin and, and they're in danger of hardening their hearts, um, which we're going to talk about some more as we go too. It seems like it's in Ephesians 4 as well, <coughs> the passage above where they're darkened in their understanding. A similar concept, right? Yeah. Well, and it's related. You know, all these things are all kind of related, right? We have this darkened understanding. We have this, this uh, that leads into this debased mind, doing whatever we want. There's less and less restraints that the Lord puts upon them. And then it just pours out into, you know, you, you made your bed, now sleep in it. Kind of thing. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so number four... What is meant by strong delusion? I would say it means that we deceive ourselves into thinking all kinds of strange things. Okay. Thinking strange things. Right? We, uh, we believe the lie, but it's not just a little lie, maybe, because it says strong delusion. And uh, a lot of time there are uh, massively believed strong delusions. You know, something that affects an entire people or even nation uh, or the world. You know, I, can what are, I can do anything I want. I can control, control of anything. I can do what I want. Yeah. Yeah, that goes all the way back to the fall too, right? What might be some examples of strong delusions that people believe today? Uh, transgenderism. Okay. Morning headlines. Okay, just FYI, I have an upcoming appointment with someone who is experiencing that. <clears throat> In the process of becoming a man. Yeah. Okay. We we got the whole gender issue, right? And and that's a really good example. And you know, the, it's a strong delusion, and it, it it begins and has begun to really infiltrate our whole culture and the culture of the Western world. And the thing that's that's the worst about it is the church saying it's okay. Mm 
in certain places, right? So the strong delusion is even getting into the church, and everyone's believing that God is okay with you pretending to be another gender or no gender, which is an abomination against how he created us. It's, a, it's, an, it's an affront upon his sovereignty. You know, and they'll say, God made me this way. Well, he also made you want to steal and lie and do all kinds of other things, you know, because of your fallen nature. But no, he's not okay with those things. So, you know, it's a strong delusion. That's a really good one. And I don't understand how the churches can, can say that's all right if they are reading in black and white God's word which says it is not all right. Yeah, well, in the end, they say that God's love for everybody trumps everything else. So God loves everybody, so it's okay. And, and they will appeal to science to answer questions rather than reading scripture. Science, science seems to indicate that uh, people are born this way, which isn't true. Um, but, you know, so, you know, obviously we're misreading scripture because, you know, science has to be right. So, you know. Those kinds of issues come into play, which are totally unbiblical. And very similar to that is evolution. There's one church that wants to take the phrase wrath of God out of one of the hymns. Right? Denying the wrath of God. Because he's a loving God. You know, that would be another one. No hell. There's no hell. Yeah? How could a loving God send people to hell? Well... He's, he's also a righteous God. He's a righteous judge. He's going to punish what he is. Yeah, I think there's a strong delusion that people don't believe that there is a God. Well, that's true. Absolutely. Forget all that. There's no God at all. There's a strong delusion. Remember people don't believe that Christ is divine. That he was what? That Christ is not divine. Yeah. And, and, and we could go on, right? Yeah. All these strong delusions. There's no hell. What point is there in any morality whatsoever? You're never going to be punished for anything. Right? Just do what you want. And that goes back to, to Nazism, you know? Um, oh my goodness. Uh, what, what was uh, the Aryan? The Aryanism. You know, that was the whole thing. I became, the, you know, there's a pure race. And, and this, this had its roots from uh, evolution, too, you know? There's a pure race. We got to get rid of all these these lesser races so that we can evolve into the greatest that humans can be. And you know, strong and, delusion. And, and to the no hell thing, that leads to some uh, actual like real life issues because then j justice has to be done here. Mm. And you really lose a presumption mm. of innocence, and people are more okay. You know, if they're not judged here. Mm -hmm. then there's not judged anywhere. Mm -hmm. So we have to scramble and make sure we find evidence that doesn't exist to convict these people and God. So the justice <coughs> it really is harmed if you don't mm -hmm. believe in hell. Right. All right, we need to move on. But yeah, strong delusions. All right, now, five. Uh, and, and we're starting to, to wade into some of the questions that uh, Mary was bringing up earlier. Uh, the next few questions we're going to be talking about some of these things. So, number five, how can it be right for God to send people strong delusions as uh, second, second Thessalonians 2 affirms that he does? You know, how, how can that be right? Sounds, sounds like it's not just. It's not good. God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false. If, uh, if Romans 1 an indication, God is giving people over to do the things that they already want to do. So okay. The strong delusions would be consistent Today. with that idea, I think. Okay. God is letting them go. You know, we talked about, we talked about earlier how God is restraining evil within people, right? So God is actually lessening his restraint. 
of evil within people. Okay? You know, the, the, the B is very similar. I'll just give you B, because uh, the, the B is, you know, God is not doing it directly. The, the person is doing what they want. Uh, any any examples in scripture? Actually, we'll we'll skip that. That's number seven. We'll get there in a minute. All right. So number six. What is meant by hardness of heart? And uh, we'll see that in Romans two five. I mean, Ezekiel talks about, when it talks about the new covenant, it talks about God taking away their heart of stone and giving them hearts of flesh. So, at least in that passage, a stony heart or a hard heart would be unbelief. Okay, unbelief. Yeah, would be uh, that, yes. kind of reprobation. That's, you know, unbelief is one, one way that we exhibit a hard heart, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Seems to be raising a fist against God and his principles. Okay. Okay, so we have unbelief. Then we have like the opposite. We believe, but so what? I'm going to do my own thing. Okay? What about right in the middle? <laughs> Is there such a thing as a middle? Indifference. <clears throat> I don't care. I don't care. You know, yeah, I, I know that's right, but... I don't, I don't care. Now, there's a lot of different ways that hardness of heart is uh, is exhibited, but you know, there's there's a lack of conscience. There's there's a, a wounded conscience. Um, so anyway, that's that's what we're talking about with this hardness of heart. And you know, they're not going to respond to the gospel. You can bring the gospel to them over and over and over and over. And, and it's just a hard heart. Can't, uh, can't receive it. All right, so number seven. Give some Bible examples of people who are given over to hardness of heart. Pharaoh. Okay, excellent. Tell me about Pharaoh. Why do you say Pharaoh was given over to hardness of heart? Well, he was, uh, Moses was directed to uh, give him scenarios to let the people go. Alright, let my people go. God would continue to harden Pharaoh's heart to fulfill his purpose. Okay. And uh, what's interesting about the verses in that passage? You guys know? Let's, we can flip over there. Uh, Exodus 14. So this is this is down here toward the end, right, of, of the whole the whole stuff. Because we've had the plagues all the way back in chapter seven. And then down here at the end, chapter 14, verse 4, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And uh and he's going to pursue you guys through the Red Sea, and then I'll, I'll, I'll destroy them all. But earlier, after each of the plagues, it says that Pharaoh, Pharaoh's heart, in uh, chapter 7, verse 22, it says, So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened, and he would not listen. Um, and I, I should have looked this up beforehand. <coughs> But somewhere, and it's several places, it says, and Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Or some of these plagues. And so, that goes back to what I erased. You know, they're, they're doing 
what they want to do. They're doing what they want to do, and God hardening their heart is just lessening his restraint of evil in the person so that they are more and more free to do the evil that they want to do. Or what's another example besides Pharaoh? How about Saul? <clears throat> King Saul, right? Anyway, think of how King Saul had a hardness of heart. You know, it's 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 obvious when you're reading. You know, Pharaoh is does not make any sense. You're reading through. How can he not? Let the people go. I mean, his whole country is getting destroyed every time. And it's just, it's just this pride thing, it seems, right? How can he be so stupid? Just let him get him out. You know, the quicker they get out of here, the better we can go back to our lives. It makes no sense. And Saul's doing the same thing. I'm going to kill David. And he, he'll, he goes into this like, crazy, psychotic rampage to kill David. And then at the end, it's like, oh, yeah, David's, David's my servant. He's my faithful servant. He's helping me out. He's he's had these. He's not trying to kill me. He's not trying to kill me. What am I doing? And then he's, and then all of a sudden it's, he's back. So I gotta kill David. David's trying to take control. He's gonna he's gonna kill me. And it's just anytime you see something weird going on like that in scripture, you see God loosening uh, re the restraint of evil, and they're doing what they want to do, and it's crazy stuff. It's basically just following a wrong-headed path without the con ignoring the consequences, or regardless of the consequences. They're totally oblivious. Here's another one. Judas. What? You follow around Jesus all these years? You know he's the Messiah. There's no doubt. You know he's sent from God. He's got this wisdom that cannot be from mankind. This this guy, this is it. What's I'm, he all, I'm always shocked. I'm always shocked reading the gospel. Of, I think it's the only gospel that tells you this, but I might be wrong. But where it says he was skimming money off the top. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For all the giving. It's like what? Yeah. The whole time Jesus is preaching all these. I mean, the best preacher ever. Your 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 heart is being struck with all these. And he just, okay, yeah. And Jesus knows it. And who is he put in charge of the money? And multiple Jesus, times, you do that. <laughs> they, they must know by that point, Jesus knows their thoughts. Because there's multiple times when Jesus knowing their thoughts answered. You know. Right, right. Yeah, Jesus, you keep track of the money. Oh, you want to go give it to the poor? Good, good job. Go do that. He's pocketing a little bit as he goes, you know. All right, number eight. We're running out of time. Uh, what is meant by horror of conscience? I, I, I you know, it's a, it's a horrible concept, right? But I love that phrase, horror of conscience. Horror of conscience, and we see that in um, that section in the middle there. Uh, horrors of conscience. Isaiah thirty-three, Genesis four, Matthew twenty-seven. Is that like just like what it says there? Being afraid and trembling and living in fear. Is that? Um, yeah. Even even unbelievers have this horror of conscience. I mean, I, as believers, we we know there's a hell. We know there's a judgment. We know what we deserve, right? If we really get God's grace, then we know what we deserve. Because when we look at God's grace, that's why we're so amazed at His grace. Because we know what we deserve. But even the unbelievers who are living in denial, you know, they, they still, their conscience is always gnawing at them. You know this is wrong. You know you can't get away with this. You know. And in Romans 1, it says, everyone knows there's a God. <clears throat> there are no atheists, really. Everyone knows. In the, in the worst and darkest times, the atheist will pray, Lord, save me. Everyone knows. And so there's this horror of conscience in them 
just constantly gnawing. I know I deserve judgment for this. I know I deserve it. And on the day of judgment, nobody's going to say anything about how I didn't know. Because they all know. Yeah. They all know. All right, number nine. How does Paul, in Romans 1.28, explain the presence of vile and gross sins in the world? And uh, those are the Romans passages. Uh, Romans 1.28, 129. That, that, that whole passage, or 126, rather. God gave them up. Yeah, God gave them up. He gives them up. You want to live that way? You're going to continue to ignore me, ignore my commands, ignore this love and grace that I'm offering you? Fine. I'll give you up. You go do what you want to do. And he lessens and lessens his restraint of evil upon them. And they go more and more into foolishness, lawlessness, depravity, darkness of heart and mind, blindness. He just gives them up. You go, you go do what you're going to do. All right. Uh, I, I thought I was going to have like time left over. So maybe that's why I've been talking so much. So now I'm kind of in trouble. Um, i got to talk my way out of it. Okay, so... Number 10. How should we look upon the present condition of the world of nature? And, uh, you know, we read that earlier. Yeah, ever since the fall, God said, the ground is cursed. In Romans 8, we read about creation groaning under the, this weight of sin, longing for, for the day of resurrection where everything will be made new, right? The Lord says, I am making all things new. It's going to be a new heavens, a new earth. Everything's been corrupted. And so when we look at disease, that's a punishment for the sin. We look at the, the natural disasters, the hurricanes, the tornadoes, the earthquakes, the blizzards, the droughts, and all the famine and all that kind of stuff. That, that, that all goes back to the flood even. The world still hasn't recovered from the flood. And all the stuff that has happened is because of the flood and it's still going on. Um, corrupted animals and plants. Animals didn't used to eat meat. Um, Plants didn't used to have thorns, you know. All that stuff has come out of the punishment of sin, the corruption of the world. All right, number 11. In what sense is the curse um, upon the world of nature a punishment for sin? Um, actually, I'll do both of these at the same time. In what sense is the curse upon the world of nature, number 11, a punishment for sin, and in what sense is physical death itself a punishment for sin? <clears throat> and we're going to look at it uh, sinners versus uh, believers. And we know that believers are also sinners, right? Okay. But the Bible does talk about sinners as a category of non believers, even though we still sin. We just don't like it. All right, so <clears throat> for sinners, all of this stuff that we've been talking about, this horrible stuff, really is a punishment. It's a punishment. It's, it's God's wrath. It's the result of, of sin as punishment. It's, um, it's wrath. It's what we deserve, you know, including death. But we can't we can't talk about these things in the same term, in the same terms for believers. Why not? We have a hope. We have a hope. All things work together for our good. Okay. All things work together for good. That is what Jesus Christ. Christ. All right. Since we have Christ, Christ. <coughs> 
took our punishment. All right? So we, we can't get punishment anymore. Christ took it. We don't have the wrath of God. We're not looking forward to that. We're looking forward to a, we have a hope, right? So all the punishment, all the, all the effects of sin, we can't think of them as, as the wrath of God to us. Oh, what we death. It's what we deserve. All right. <clears throat> and death, you know, Christ is our resurrection. So we're, we're not going to, I mean, we're still going to physically die, but we're going to get uh, eternal life, right? So for us, we, we don't think about it in these terms. We think about it as God's discipline. Okay? We think about it in terms of... Um, um, yeah, I'm thinking of the Peter verse, but how's it go, Bob? How's the Peter verse go about suffering? Um, it's necessary. Uh, suffering is necessary. If necessary, uh, you be tested through various trials. Right, tested. Okay. All these kinds of things. Uh, because, oh, and instead of wrath, it's, it's actually love. You know, we think about these hard things that we go through. It's actually love for the believer because he's teaching us. He's growing us. He's causing us to be the light in the world, not the darkness. All right, well, we're, we're over. Um, I don't think I got to uh, all the parts that Mary was, was wanting to get to. So...